very interesting lecture by Dr. Sharad Gutekunde, who's one of India's authorities on air pollution. And obviously air pollution is something on many people's mind, but yet we don't necessarily know enough. Air pollution is one of the topics that's a subset of the broader energy and environment work we're doing at Brookings India. I'm Rahul Tongia, a fellow with Brookings India. And of course, most of you may already know Dr. Kutikande, but it, it's my pleasure to welcome you here. And thank you for coming to give this lecture. Before we, I hand over to our distinguished speaker, I wanted to just share a little of some of the work we're doing at Brookings India in energy and environment including we have an ongoing multi-year series of studies on the coal sector in India. And so we have a study on ash from coal, which I wanted to give a two, few minutes of teaser onto. That will be released. The work will be finished in a few weeks. We will have a separate event on that. But in some ways, it's complementary to looking at the air pollution side. We're looking at it from a slurry, from a ash ponds, or non, not the air pollution side, but the rest of the pollution side of, of ash from power plants. So of course, as many of you know, power plants are a big deal. India is somewhere in the order of 78 plus percent of its electricity coming from coal. And unfortunately, India's coal is very ash heavy. It's depending on the grade, somewhere in the order of 33, 35 plus percent ash. And so emissions are a very strong concern, which if you believe or more likely just go through the newspapers, WHO had some figure, I think, of six million premature deaths or something in India every year? Or All included, not just from air pollution. Not just from air po uh, pollution, yeah. And so clearly this is a very, very important topic. Um, uh, we have here just a photo, okay. and they want to encourage the utilization into <coughs> things like the brick industry. Cement actually is the largest user of power plant ash, but it's already doing very well. So now the growth really needs to come from the brick sector. And one of the questions we're asking is, is the target of using up this ash by 1920 feasible? That's the quantitative study that we're doing. So this is what happens in a generic power plant. We are using a hypothetical 100 megawatt power plant. And other than the coal production or leakage or ash along the way in transport, you have a throughput assuming a certain efficiency of the plant and a certain PLF. We're using the average 14, 15 sort of baseline. A, a 100 megawatt power plant would use 0.36 million tons of coal a year, of which ash is about 0.12 million tons. What happens to that ash? 80% is fly ash or comes up, and 20% is bottom ash of the combustion pro processing process, which sort of sinks down and the collected ash goes into an ash pond. Off the ash that sort of goes up, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, there is electrostatic precipitators, ESPs, which are meant to capture the ash so it's not released to the environment. These have an efficiency in the order of 95%, so only 5% of that amount is released to the environment. I'm sure Sharad will correct me on these numbers, but that's the order of magnitude, order of magnitude estimate. And so what happens to this ash? Not all of it is utilized. About today on the left side, you can see both generation of ash, which is growing at 6.5% over the last 10 years, and the utilization of this ash, which is growing at 10%, 10.5% over the last 10 years. We're still only at a sm about a 55% utilization of this ash. So we're not achieving 100% utilization. Most of it, what is being utilized, goes to the cement industry, and then other areas do use it. So there are norms in what tr qualities of coal can be transported to what distances. Uh, no transportation for power plants is allowed with ash over 34%. And there's mandatory utilization by brick users, as well as the thermal power plants have to pay for transporting such ash within a certain distance. So there are some limitations of these norms. Measurement limitations, which is, of course, something dear to Sharad's heart on, on the emission side. You're only capturing based on ass assumptions of flow rate, not measurements. The only thermal power plants are measured. Other users of coal are not monitored for their ash utilization. The brick manufacturers, you saw how low tech they were. They are not being monitored well, forget uh, real time or anything as sophisticated. And we're not accounting for leaked ash in, in these calculations. Who's paying for it? Does this make sense? 
there's no oversight on the brick industry. And so what we are doing in the study, just the teaser, is a bottom-up model of these calculations. Where is this ash going to? How is it being used? What are the financial implications? And what are key policy needs to actually get higher utilization of this ash? So with that, uh, I wanted to uh, hand over the mic. And you, you have from the invitation a more detailed bio of Dr. Guttekunde, and I'll request him to actually share what he feels is relevant, but he is an independent researcher as well as a respected advisor to a lot of studies, government, and decision making in India on air, air pollution. And he's the co-founder and CT, or what's the title? Oh, the, your title? Scientist, Scientist director <laughs> of ur urban emissions. So if I could now request her to um, share his presentation. Hi. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation and, and allowing me to share some of the new programs that we are launching and how we are using the information databases that we are generating for more for policy relevant uh, exercises and, and advices. Um, so urban emissions, it's a, a very small research group, independent research group. We don't have an office. Uh, all of our colleagues are like, working out of their homes I and mean, we are spread across India. And I live in Goa. I used to be in Delhi but ran away. <laughs> um, is it lower pollution there? <laughs> it is lower pollution there. But then we have a lot of family as well which we don't have in Delhi. So, um, uh, so we, we primarily do research on air pollution and we, we don't touch any other sector. It's not I mean, it's primary, purely out of choice. And we do uh, put together policy notes for cities, sectors, national bodies, and, and I'm also on the advisory boards for some of the steering committees on different topics. So what I will do is, uh, the, our, from the discussion, discussions that I had with Rahul, I'll, I'll eventually focus on uh, power plants and brick kilns. That, that's our main uh, uh, focus of this talk. But I want to give you an idea or, or an overview of where we are going with this and what kind of information uh, is really necessary to, to put together a good policy note that the policy makers can actually take uh, note of. So I'll start with something like this. Uh, this is actually uh, a giant vacuum cleaner set up uh, in Connaught Place in 2010, right before the Commonwealth Games, with permission of Municipal Corporation of Delhi. Uh, an Italian company managed to secure this permission and uh, the main seller was that this is going to suck up pollution in Connaught Place. Okay? This is not uh, truly looking at the dynamics of air pollution. And it's not, you know, Connaught Place is not a, a dome where you put an air filter and it sucks up pollution. It's a very dynamic area. You, I mean, just look at the truck that passes through. I don't think this is uh, enough to, um, to do anything. And it costs 2.5 crores. When we, we launched a small campaign, not just a, campaign, a, a cartoon of this. I mean, if we could actually suck up pollution by putting up filters in the air, in an in a open air situation, and we really don't need to worry about anything else. Uh, anyway, a week later, MCD took the permission off, and they had to take that box away, and they never talked about it again. <laughs> so these things happen if the policy makers, whether the municipal corporation of Delhi or anybody else, they don't uh, have an idea of how pollution works. Okay? If it's, a, it's not a box. So that's the whole idea. And we, we really, I mean, you will be very surprised how much uh, the, uh, they really don't understand the, the, just the basics of how this whole process happens. So we have a new portal called IndiaAirQuality.info. The main uh, uh, target audience is public and also pol uh, public bodies so that they have an idea of uh, where the information is coming from, what kind of information is coming from different sources and, and what do you need in order to make a good policy judgment. Okay. Uh, you, you can you have lots of details in there. Uh, one of the things that we are nowadays focusing on is to also tell each district what will be the air pollution in the next three days. So I'm not just telling you this is the pollution today or what we have measured yesterday or day before yesterday, but also telling the next three days, forecasting it. And a lot of different products are uh, online. 
and we have vetted information from major almost all the sources that you can think of both anthropogenic sources non anthropogenic sources i'll give you a quick flavor of these things and looking at all the pollutants not just the particulate pollution which is uh, our primary discussant in in most of the times both in media and policy circles but looking at all the criteria pollutants that that have a direct impact on our health and each of these sources have a very st strong signature that can be tracked to different sectors so one pollutant particulate matter it's a say mixed bag I mean, it's not easy to pinpoint saying all my particulate pollution is coming from transport or all my pollution is coming from power plants or brick kilns or cooking. It's a mixed bag and it's a, a very complex uh, pollutant because it has both primary contributions and also uh, secondary contributions. Like sulfur dioxide becomes sulfates and becomes particulate matter. Same thing with NOx becomes nitrates and becomes particulate matter. So it's a mixed bag. But there are other pollutants which give us a better sense of uh, where they could be coming from. Sulfur dioxide has a very strong signature to power plants, all the coal that's burned. So you can actually see uh, quick uh, plumes coming out of, okay, yeah, plumes at uh, all the different power plants, both coastal power plants and also the inland power plant. Chhattisgarh is actually a, a, a hotbed for it. You go to other pollutants like NOx, so you end up seeing very strong signatures along the roads, highways. So this is a very, um, we're looking at a macro level at the at India scale, at a very fine, re not a fine resolution to look at the urban areas, but you can quickly see the highlight, uh, the, uh, the other areas. So now uh, CO, again, it has a strong linkage to both your power plants, um, transport sector, cooking and heating, but nowadays, a, a, a new source for the season is the um, heating itself, the open fires. So this is a satellite image retrieval all for all the open fires that are happening in Punjab and Haryana uh, two days ago. So we can see the, the hot spots which are uh, really increasing. And overlay this with the wind pattern that we are seeing nowadays, of most of this is northwesterly winds coming from uh, Punjab and Haryana, picking up these emissions and flowing down towards the Delhi area. So we estimate about 10% of this pollution for PM2.5 can be attributed to open fires. And this is the, the low season. Give it a couple of more weeks, this uh, band of Indo-Gangetic area, this is going to light up even more, when, given what we have seen in 2012, 2013, and 2014, 2015. So this is going to change. And this red band is going to maybe going up to like 30, 40%. So, so while we are forecasting a number saying the pollution in this district is going to be so much, but we are also trying to understand how much of that pollution coming from different, what, what source, power plants, industries, cooking and heating. And a lot of these details of how we are documenting each of these are um, readily available on the site. So everything is in the public domain, even the results that we are uh, forecasting there, it's a public product. Uh, if somebody wants to scrape off and use it, they can easily uh, do so. And each of these sectors have a lot more details. I'm, I'm, I'm just showing you one uh, graph and saying, oh, we're doing this. But there are a lot more details in each of these sectors. And, and uh, I will focus on two of these, power plants and brick kilns, and how detailed the kind of information available from uh, uh, both in the public bodies and then the kind of surveys that we have done to, to document the, the contributions of these. For the Coal-fired power plants, we released two different, two reports, one in 2013 and one in 2014. The 2013, uh, and the reason uh, for targeting the coal-fired thermal power plants was uh, something like this. So we do have ambient monitoring stations. Most of these are in the cities. And if you look at the sulfur dioxide signature from these stations, and all the cities, these numbers are very, very low. Okay. The reason being, in the cities, we took care of this pollutant, SO2, by reducing the sulfur content in the diesel that we use in the cities. It's really uh, at the lowest levels uh, that we have seen. And in 2020, it's going to be even more lower. So we're going to have a ultra low sulfur fuel coming into the cities. Instead of targeting 100 million vehicles, I mean, even vehicles have to be targeted as well. But targeting 100 points is a lot more easier than targeting 100 million vehicles. And it's easy to 
um, make them accountable for it. Technology is not an issue anymore. So we, but we don't do a flue gas desulfurization unit at the power plants, even though the environmental impact, environment impact assessments require you to allocate land for it. Okay? So we have companies like BHEL manufacture low NOx boilers and export them, but they don't get used in the power plants that are being commissioned in India. Okay? So the entire justification for that is we don't have regulation to control SO2 or NOx emissions, so we have only a regulation for PM2.5. So this was in, uh, in 2013. And there was also a loophole with the PM 2.5 norm that was in uh, effect till last year, is that if a boiler size is under 210 megawatts, you can emit this much, which is a higher number, compared to a boiler which is 500 megawatts. So you have this um, standard. So you have power plants operating 200 megawatt units, lot more than the 500 megawatt unit. So in 2014, that separation was uh, closed. Then, since 2014, all the power plants that came online, now they're all either 500 megawatts or even now 600 megawatts, and now they are looking at most of them coming online now at 800 megawatts. So, that bifurcated loophole led to operations of a lower, low efficient, a lower quality boiler. So, uh, in 2012, 70% of the boilers in operation were 210 megawatts or less. So these kind of loopholes needed to be addressed. And then the environmental impact assessment procedures themselves. So if you want to put up a power plant, you just needed to an, do an evaluation for a 10 kilometer radius and then a more stringent one for about 50 kilometer radius. That's not enough. So you have stacks of 275 meters coming up where the pollution can disperse up to 200, 300 kilometers away from the source. So you, you're not able to capture the true impact of a power plant. So these things need to be addressed. So very simple messages were put together and then they actually took note of that. And uh, we did a similar analysis for all the power plants which were uh, coming or expected to come online by 2030. And Anyway, so in um, April, 20, on April 2015, a draft set of proposals were introduced and they were ratified by uh, PM Modi in December 2015, right after the COP. So these norms are now in other countries and all the coal-fired power plants are now expected to reach uh, or, or adhere to them by end of 2017. So this when, is also retroactive for existing plants? Retroactive for existing as well. So it, it's a, now they are lobbying for extended time period and things like that. So it's a give and take ball game that's going on. But, but the fact that a, a new standard has been introduced and there, there is a lobby to get it implemented by end of 2017, it's, it's a big step. Uh, and then now uh, we want to see how that was changing. So now we are in the process of trying to explain if these things do come online by default even if you do the lowest of the flue gas desulfurization units and change the, retrofit the boilers for low NOx, we have a 50% drop. I mean, this is the default drop that we are going to see at the end of 2017 if all the power plants go this way. And, and uh, so it's not just about the coal, but we have to start looking at the other um, uh, fuel use in the, in the power generation sector. So one is the diesel itself. The diesel power plants are actually now tapering off. Either I mean, they're not commissioning them anymore because we have enough uh, uh, grid base, especially for the industries, uh, grid base for electricity coming from coal, and also there's a push for the renewables as well. So most of our work is uh, primarily focused on air pollution and not on the energy scenario. So I, I won't go into that. I mean, we, we have uh, expect like Rahul and, and their group uh, looking at those uh, issues. But the, the diesel itself, it becomes a big, big factor uh, for one other sector, is the telecoms. And the TRAI's report, it says 40% of the electricity that they use actually from the grid and 60% is diesel. That, that's huge. So I mean, even if they take it from grid, uh, this is one sector which, which can go independent. 
they can be totally independent of grid electricity or diesel generator sets and they, they can go 100% renewable and, and you have a completely different picture. And we, we see this uh, as like more and more of the urban sectors becoming, I'm sorry, rural sectors becoming urban or number of connections increasing in the rural areas. There's a lot of give and take of uh, like whether do we support the rural electrification or do we support the mobile uh, towers. So there are a lot of stories that can be spinned off. But from an air pollution perspective, uh, the power generation and diesel generator sets, mm, and they are a, a big component uh, uh, that we see in different cities. So if you go to indiaairquality.info, you can see district by district reports, and I, I put a sample of them here. So, yeah, go ahead. X-axis is the, the days, the coming days, the coming three days, hour by hour. Um, sorry, there are, I clubbed too many here, but. So this is the forecast that was made last night for the next three days. And this is hour by hour how that's changing. So this is a 72 hour layout uh, for each of these cities. So Korba is a very interesting place in Chhattisgarh. Um, it has a population density very similar to Delhi. It has a uh, power plant capa generation capacity of 10 gigawatts. Okay. So there are four big power plants which uh, combined they have 10 giga, gigawatt of power generation and obviously the contribution of the power plants to the district is, is huge. So close to 50% of the pollution is coming from this. But here's the kicker. If you look at uh, use of LPG or electricity for cooking and heating in different districts from the census and if you look at uh, Delhi, you have 85% is uh, LPG and electricity usage and 15% is uh, random. Korba has, is the other way around. 15% is LPG and electricity, and 85% is biomass, coal, and all the other random stuff. This is in spite of the district generating 10 gigawatts of electricity. So basically, they generate, it gets into the grid, and they get the pollution. <laughs> so we, we are trying to highlight some of these uh, inequalities uh, between districts, uh, all from an from the air pollution perspective, of course. And um, Patna, again, uh, very high. It's, it's a big city, and, and Bihar does generate a good amount. I mean, they have a lot of coal uh, reserves, and they do, uh, they have only one big power plant in, in Bar, just outside Patna, about 150 kilometers away, and they have a small signature of that. So, I mean, I put this up because it has a, a story with the brick kilns as well. And then the Ahmedabad has uh, two power plants which are operational in the city and a huge industrial sector uh, which uses diesel. Um, these are the estimates? Or estimates. So these are estimates. So it's not easy to, I mean, hour by hour samples are not available from these places. So it's a combination of measurements that we are seeing both from the ground network, satellite observations, and then on top of that, we uh, we have uh, a detailed inventory that goes in for each of the sectors that's used to do the apportionment on an hour by hour basis. So this is a model number. Does there is no way of. Does the satellite give any information regarding emissions? Or? Not emission source, but they give you a pollution density. Pollution density only smoke they can give or uh, dust they can give. So they can. So do the different satellites give different signatures? Um, so there is one AVHRR, which is an infrared satellite, it tells you. Uh, how much area is under fire. So these open fires, uh, they can give you a pixel area of one, one, kilo, one square kilometer. So within a one square kilometer, it can tell you how much area is under fire. So there are other, other satellites in a, called MODIS, which gives you land use information. So we can immediately tell that pixel, is it a agricultural land or a water body or an urban area or a forest. So that gives us an idea of what kind of biomass is in that area if that area is under fire. So it, it, then it tells us, um, then there is another satellite which gives us um, light information. So the urban area is obviously much lit. So it gives you a density of how much power is being drawn into different areas. So you, depending on the intensity of the light, you can then draw on 
um, the, uh, the power consumption in, in these areas. No, NASA. So ISRO and Bhuvan, no, none of them share it on a, on a real-time basis. It's available, but not the layers that we want. So these are uh, NASA satellite databases uh, processed through two different universities, University of Maryland and, uh, and University of Colorado. And we access it from their backends. And it, it's, it's also openly available. Uh, on a 24-hour lag or two days lag, and we have a tie-up, uh, and we, we get it within 12 hours. But uh, the fact that it has to be an open analysis, so when we, we are not keeping it for ourselves. Whatever we get, we post it uh, as well, and it goes online, and we also use it for analysis like these. And, uh, and I'll, I'll get, eventually I'll get back to the website, and I'll show you a lot but more I, of I that. I just observe the y-axis scale that For, yeah. So different areas are obviously at different scales. Um, yeah. So as, uh, as Rahul was saying, um, uh, much of this uh, from the power plants, we're talking about what's going into the air, but we have to worry about what's staying on the ground and, and how much of that is contributing to different pollution levels. And the ash, so this was one statement from Badalpur power plant, uh, which says, oh, we're using 113% of the, of the ash that we're generating. So it was very odd. I mean, if you're generating ash, you could be using 100%. When you're not importing ash and using it in some yeah, form or the other. The but that then the pond is actually going from your own power plant, right? Yeah, but on the annual <laughs> basis, they may be transporting or using. Yeah, energy. so this I mean, it was a very funny statement, but they made. <laughs> we thought it was very funny. But so anyway, so there is a strong uh, uh, understanding of ash is a problem both uh, to the soil leaching and different issues and one sector that uh, we are trying to address both from an air pollution perspective is like how much of um, brick how many of these bricks are being made how they are being made what kind of resources are being used both from the fuel perspective and then if we improve the efficiencies in these uh, in this uh, cleanse what kind of reductions are we expecting both from the urban air quality perspective and also from uh, from a regional uh, air pollution perspective. Um, much of this work is being done with the uh, uh, Green Knowledge Solutions Group here in Delhi uh, and uh, with uh, due support from Shakti, actually. We have one of the members from the group. So right now, not much of ash is actually used uh, in the brick making industry. It's a very, very small portion. So even though there are norms asking brick kilns to use it more, some of the surveys done by the by Samir Maithal's group, uh, GKSPL, uh, there was the manufact the brick owners have their own concerns that they can't sell these ash bricks so much, especially to the to the the, the individual house builders uh, as much as they want. So there's always a, a stockpile that uh, that's left out. And so we, we also started uh, looking at uh, where these kilns are, how much are they uh, producing, and how they are producing. Since we are in Delhi, so here's a map. So this is an 80 by 80 kilometer area for Delhi. And all these dots are actually mapped out brick kilns. There are 850 of them. So in the late 90s, in the, the Delhi, they, they, they had an ordinance saying all the brick kilns have to move out. And they did, but they literally moved to across the border. And this is actually the Delhi border. So you can see it's the first come, first of So the ones which moved out first, they basically crossed the border first. And then slowly, slowly, they just moved a little bit further. So if you go out of Ghaziabad, there's a cluster of about 200 brick kilns. And if you go to Rohini area, there's a cluster of about 100 brick kilns. And I mean, this is a box here, but if you go past uh, Gurgaon, Sona area, there are a lot of brick kilns there as well. So they were moved out, but not really cleaned. They, they were still using the same uh, technology. So we did a quick analysis of um, the, how much of the contribution is coming, f especially to the South Delhi area. So you don't have any brick kilns in South Delhi area, but uh, now October, early October, all the brick kilns are in operation at the moment. And uh, if you 
add that to the meteorology and everything. So we, we see 10% of the contribution in South Delhi area can be attributed to pollution coming from these brick kilns. So in the brick manufacturing season, which is now, October to March. And this is not a phenomenon restricted to just Delhi. Uh, it's across the country. Uh, if you go to Chennai, uh, we have a very, again, this is the Chennai, Greater Chennai border, and then they're right, after the, right outside the border. So within this 40 by 40 kilometers, you have uh, 500 brick kilns. And the, the kind of fuel changes with the area as well. So when we are surveying this, uh, this area, they were using not just coal and uh, agricultural waste, the resi agricultural residue, but they were also using bunker fuel because of the port. So ships come in, they're cleaning up, so you get the bunker fuel for cheap. It's basically thick tar sludge. So you can just take out those tanks, or they're emptying it, take your tank and then fill it up and bring it. And you basically, between the bricks with the uh, agricultural residue, this tough it, uh, tar in, and then you have uh, a lot of pollution because of that. So the production cycle goes, you have molding, drying, and then the burning. So for air pollution, that burning is the big uh, source. So clamp style, basically packing up everything, and they burn it for like 10, 15 days. And that's the most inefficient. And uh, the, the, the ones with the kilns, uh, and uh, stacks are mostly in the Indo-Gangetic plain, and we exported our technology also to Pakistan and Bangladesh and Nepal. So the entire Indo-Gangetic plain has the same technology running across. And then in the south, we have slightly different, uh, predominantly clamps. So especially if you if you drive from um, uh, Bombay to Pune, Mumbai to Pune, you will see a lot of these clamps. Uh, clamp style burning happening right now. And if you're going from Bangalore to Chennai, Chennai to Bangalore, you will see all along this clamp style brick making is happening, just piles burning. And the kind of fuel that goes into these kilns is, is it changes from area to area. And, and uh, again, we are, we're looking from a ambient air pollution perspective, but occupational health hazard is also very strong. These guys are breathing much higher concentrations in these areas. And again, Samir's group has done extensive work on, on, on documenting what kind of fuels are being used in different clusters. So in the south, you have predominantly biomass usage. And where access to alternate fuels, they are being used in different areas. In the Indo-Gangetic plain, majority is basically coal, uh, fuel, heavy fuel residues, agricultural waste. Uh, a picture from Amritsar, they basically uh, take tar, uh, combine it with agricultural waste, and, and stuff it into the bricks. Uh, this is something from Kabul, and it was a very nice piece that was done. It was in Dhaka, uh, using rubber tires as, as a fuel. And this is not just in Dhaka. If you go to Ludhiana, Ludhiana manufactures, I mean, we have the largest tire manufacturing industries in Ludhiana. If you go outside Ludhiana, there are about 200 brick kilns. They use leftover tires from these, uh, from these plants and, and, and use it for burning purposes. Again, one more from uh, different areas, dust. So, and there are solutions for this. I mean, you can, if you're still using these dirty fuels, uh, it, it can be burnt more efficiently, but the technology has to change. So this hasn't trickled down uh, as much as we want to. So this is where uh, some of the, uh, we were taking a lot of emission measurements in different, different kilns and trying to address this. Um, and if we, even if we change to a next order kiln technology available for brick kilns, we can see a 50 to 50% 50 drop in uh, this. So one place where we are seeing a strong, um, uh, uh, <laughs> acceptance, is in Bihar, the Bihar Pollution Control, which is the work that we've done with uh, Shakti and uh, Shakti Foundation and, 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 and Green Solutions, trying to address how do we change the kiln technology so that the efficiency goes up, up at least 50% without affecting the way owners are operating it right now. A simple change in the way they organize the bricks 
from the normal stacking to a zigzag stacking, so you have 40% drop. So one cluster uh, to the southeast, so these guys have actually come forward and the Bihar Pollution Control Board is uh, giving them I think financial support and technical support in addressing this. So this is only one of the sectors and, and one of the cities. So we are hoping that more cities will actually come forward. Um, so again, this is only one of the stories that uh, we, we try to focus more, but there are a lot more stories for, for all the other sectors as well that we are not going uh, in detail. So the, the point, um, the, so w one of the points that we wanted to make is from the air pollution perspective, these two sectors have a very large contribution. But at the same time, a, a lot of the, the energy and the resources uh, side of the story is something that we just not, not told yet. Uh, I mean, especially if, if the, how do we expand the use of ash from the power plants and the brick kilns so that uh, you, you address both. And we have each of these soil pollution have problem a lot more the power plants, but also and, uh, a, and, and, and a lot similar more stories soil for, erosion. Uh, the cities uh, that soil we are now trying to because most of the big kilns actually take soil from. Uh, okay. From agricultural lands. Yeah, I'll clay. stop there. But so how uh, do we address that? I'll be so a combination to, of I'll take questions and then also have a lot of other resources that I want and to show the depending on uh, question, the, the questions that we get. And that is something that came up in, in the discussions and then and led to uh, you know, trying to focus that into these sectors. But if you go to our website, which has have been fairly high, which is a bit unusual for October, especially in the Indo Gangetic Plains, but that is actually changing. So this is the nighttime forecast. Um, for today, tomorrow, but that's slowly changing. So what we have actually found is the, the Western Ghats temperatures have actually dropped significantly <laughs> now that the Western monsoons have changed. And we are seeing some heating uh, spots coming up in those areas. Um, so for the cooking and heating sector, the inventory that goes into an analyzing how much of the contribution from that sector is, is, is very dynamic. So it's not just we're saying that northern area, northern India <coughs> temperatures drop in November, December, so let's burn and put a number there for a contribution. But it's, it's linked to the temperature profiles. I mean, of course, typically October we would see heating, but this time we are not seeing that. We, so the inventory that goes into it is very dynamic. and. So this is, again, temperature and rainfall is also one of the satellite products that we use uh, quite significantly in pretty much all the sectors. So all, out of all the sectors that you show, um, are all this uh, forecast based on satellite data or for some of them you have ground? Some of them, uh, there is a lot of, a lot of ground-based data is also gone in. For example, in the, in the road transport sector, uh, a lot, we did a lot of work with, uh, with IIT Delhi trying to understand uh, what is the temporal uh, travel behavior. So where are the peaks for passenger transport, where are the peaks for freight transport, um, try, trying to understand the usage. So we've done surveys uh, in Delhi, in Rajkot, Vaisal, Ludhiana, Udaipur, trying to understand the, the in-use vehicle mix. So we don't want to blindly go by a number coming from the RTO saying we have 8 million vehicles. Not all vehicles are actually in use. So you need to understand the, the survival functions of these vehicles. So we, these surveys allowed us to, to build that function. Okay. And we are also trying to use many of these online resources. For example, this is the real-time traffic map for Delhi. Uh, issued by Google. Uh, more from the pollution measurement, which is not based on satellite image. So pollution measurements also, we, we, we do use that where available. But that is uh, very, very limited at the moment. So if you look at Delhi, the Delhi Pollution Control Board has six units, and two of them are not even measuring PM2.5. So in effect, you have four points for Delhi which is not a good representation. But we still use it, because it, it's some number to, to give a understanding of on the ground what's happening. Now these, uh, we, we, are, we are also distributing our information to these uh, networks which are operating low cost monitors. So I think especially in Delhi, the groups like India Spend, uh, India Open Data, 
and Ayurveda. So they are also operating their own units. So these are not calibrated units yet, but I mean, we are keeping track of those numbers and then using them for uh, calibration purposes. So, so you have to keep in mind that measurements can give you one value only. How much is the pollution? But that will not give you uh, a signature to track it to different uh, sectors. But and when we're talking to policy makers, that is actually the most important question. So they, they can get that 100 units pollution number from the, from the Central Pollution Control Board, but they can't take a case saying, okay, which one should I address first? So by default, everybody attacks transport. Because well, there was an interesting study by ISA, if you were aware of that, which did the study for Delhi and Kolkata, yeah. you know, two, two cities. And they found that transport only uh, has 10 to 15 percent. The yeah. bigger, uh, uh, the, the bigger uh, thing is the construction Dust, pollution, yeah. construction pollution, which I think was 20 to 30 percent. Yeah. So they have done a very interesting one, only about two cities. Yeah. So the same thing, the, the dust related to resuspension of vehicle movements, resuspension from vehicle movements, and construction dust. So the, those are also really big part of the inventory that goes in. And again, if vehicles are moving fast, then you have a lot of resuspension. Vehicles are moving slow, then you have lesser resuspension. So that is something that we tie up with the speeds. Uh, so here, uh, in this Google map here, this is a real-time map showing congested areas and non-congested areas. Congested areas means the vehicles are moving at very low speeds, so your resuspension is less. But nighttime, this will be all green, which means that trucks and cars are really going at high speed and loaded conditions, which means you have much higher resuspension. So this nighttime dust resuspension it goes up, it lingers even in the morning, it takes some time for it to settle down. So you have that peak that goes up till five or six when the trucks stop, but the pollution doesn't stop because of the resuspension. It actually lingers and tapers up only at 10 or 11. I mean, we see that in the measurements, but then if we have this bottom-up databases feeding that and trying to break it up, then you can start seeing different components coming from these. Um, so long story short, yeah, it's, it's not just the satellite information, but also uh, a lot of the real-time ground measurements as well. So this is a direct, when Google has tie-ups with Airtel, Reliance, all the mobile networks, and they're using mobile signals to come up with, uh, the, they use that as a proxy and give you a speed indication, congested, not congested. So then we use that as a proxy for speeds and, and dust. But that does there many ways. The size of the vehicle though. It doesn't give you a size of the vehicle. Or, yeah. or the vintage, meaning trucks versus diesel. Yeah. So that is the background of the analysis that we have to uh, so you all get make up. Yeah. You pay you have to pay for it, yeah, but we have to okay. get it. <laughs> so one thing I other thing I wanted to understand was that uh, what are the challenges you face in getting data from ECO? Like are this satellite data you use to technical terms yeah. to understand that very well? Uh, other than a land use, land cover one. Yeah. Uh, are those not satellites that India has? Because they, they have them to cover those because this is something that they should be doing. No, they also do that. Uh, they definitely do that. But I mean, we, we found the the data coming out of the NASA satellites is free, and it's I mean, we don't have to ask for permissions. So it's there. So we're basically going with that because it's just easier to access and be done with. And in the hopes that in a year or two, they will take lead and release this, and not us. Um, so it, it's a open platform data, and we, we are. If they want to host the whole system, we will be happy to transfer it to them. And we are talking to. I mean, we want to talk to all the state boards. So right now, we are talking to a couple of them. Uh, hopefully, they will come forward and take it, and then hope and others will follow. But what is the advantage of such data, which you are forecasting for next three days, for the public? What kind of you know message public should take from these data? Multiple things. One, it's a health alert, saying that okay, tomorrow's pollution is going to be 100 units and it's, it's harmful to you. So you take, uh, if you are in habit of running uh, outside, 
then you can take measures. Either you shift your time of running <coughs> to, a, to a time period where the pollution levels will be lower. So that's actually in the forecast, you can see that. And you can take measures whether I should be using a mask or should I just stay indoors or stay in office, stay at home and work longer. So these kind of measures. I mean, it's a, it's a bucket list at the moment. These are all the things that can be done. But uh, if you look at uh, a few cities in Europe, take Paris for example, if they see an alert coming tomorrow, mm -hmm. saying tomorrow is going to be a yellow or a red, and the, the city actually takes measures uh, so much so that they, they don't want to get that alert, they don't want that alert to happen. Okay. Okay, they actually block off different sections of the, of the city saying, please don't travel on these roads because we don't want the emissions coming up uh, tomorrow. But that has to follow with alternatives. So uh, when those kind of measures are put in place, that day public transportation is free. You can ride the metro, you can take the bus, it's free. But the also, city also has the option to carry the personal, load, personal passengers to a public transportation mode. But we are in a, I mean, Delhi is the, probably Delhi and Bombay are the cities with the highest share of public transportation. But it's not enough to carry the load from a load ship, even for one day. And a good example is the odd, and odd even experiment that was done. So it's just introducing 500 buses or 1,000 buses, that's not enough. So what we see is that Delhi needs at least 15,000 buses, and we operate 5,000. So when the public transportation system is fully up and about, I think a lot of measures can be uh, addressed. The but it's a, at the end of the day, it's a health alert system for the public. Or even did nothing to the pollution. It probably did only something to the traffic. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, there are many reasons for it, but yeah. You're absolutely right. There are periods when it's not a shortfall, yeah. but a management so, sort of an issue. But this is an interesting sort of question that diesel, so maybe load shedding, scheduling, even load shedding is scheduled and unscheduled. There should be a synergy with urban air pollution maps or, or predictions so that we, we can have a better health outcome. Even though the quantum of electricity could be the same, you just time shift it based on. Yeah. Uh, so, so how granular can predictions be in the sense, will I know at an hourly basis how bad and how much does it change hour to hour things, I mean, uh, air pollution. If I were to try and advise a, a load dispatcher who sets the load, shed, uh, load shedding schedule, can they, using these sorts of tools, get an hourly planning in insight? Yeah. So we have two different portals. One is India Air Quality Info, which is running at a coarser resolution, where all the products are going out at a district level. So if, you, if the district wants granular information, we will be able to provide it. So in case of Delhi, for example, so we do that at a much higher resolution, because for one, we have done a lot more detailed uh, um, assessments with IIT Delhi in trying to understand um, how the vehicles are moving in the area on an hour by hour basis and what the power, uh, power cooking, heating, brick kilns, and all the other sectors as well. So these, this information is available at a very... So this information is available at, uh, at various points. But it should yeah. be available with the load dispatcher. Yeah. So maybe a state load dispatcher, regional load dispatcher, because right now they are only concentrating whatever power is available, what networks are available, and how to manage that. Yeah. They don't build up uh, this pollution and other things. Uh, you are talking of something uh, one, level level one level higher. Yeah. yeah. So if the policy maker then uh, should think of. Yeah. So our our goal in the next couple of years is to. And we are breaking the information as much as possible so that we can cater it to as many yes. uh, stakeholders or players Especially involved. Especially stakeholders. In. Yeah. should be involved and you should sensitize yeah. the government so that these things can be in while in their time. That, so uh, that, that's our primary just goal. Just to check, yeah. this is a three-day forecast of the different sources for South Delhi? For South Delhi area.
So you, you can then start following how much is the passenger transport. For Delhi, we do it at a much higher resolution. So we have a one kilometer by one kilometer grids and covering all of NCR. So that's 80 by 80 kilometers. And so we're not only trying to understand how much is the contribution to the pollution like within the NCR region, because we have a larger domain run also happening, so we can also see what is the contribution coming from outside as well. So that, that's the only way uh, we can track or, or and, and, and uh, put a fingerprint of how much of the contribution from the open fires to the Delhi area, or how much it, there's a dust storm in April, May. This year we saw a lot more dust events uh, happen than uh, last two years. So partly because it's a lot more drier this year, and uh, the wind, wind conditions were a lot more different, and we, we, we saw that. So Wait, where does construction fit in those buckets? Was that urban dust? In the urban dust. Is construction, because yeah. that's yeah. a... So again, this is another satellite products we, we track. This is wind, wind speeds, temperature, precipitation patterns. So it really helps us uh, uh, understand that. Uh, we were earlier trying to understand uh, the, the Chennai pollution has really peaked in the last couple of days. So even though it's a, it's a port city, mainly because of that storm that's brewing in the Bay of Bengal, so a lot of pollution is actually getting pushed back onto the land instead of going from land to sea. So these small, small changes, when you, you, can, you can keep track of it in a forecast model, you can't do it on an annual basis. So we, so it's sort of um, interesting. At the end of the day, I'm a very I'm a geek, but anyway. <laughs> so there's a lot more interest for us. So but uh, long story short, yeah, so we can go very granular depending on the, uh, on the region and the request. So for Delhi, by default, we made this portal and it grants it a much higher resolution, but we, I mean, we are trying to expand it to more cities. Um, How much traffic same. could you handle? Like if we got a bunch of college students to develop apps for you that people could customize we have, one by one grid. We have full bandwidth. So, so then you yeah. could actually get everyone to get their personalized prediction on yeah. their Smart and then, uh, as I said, all the data is open, so you can just scrape it off here. But if you, there, one of the groups has asked us to customize the results for them. So we basically, you give us a format, and it can be dumped in the format, and you take it forward and use it in whichever way you want. But on a scale, if you scale up significantly, that comes down. Uh, <coughs> so, um, so right now it's a totally scale issue. One of the interesting questions that policymakers may be interested in as a researcher I am how Pareto are some of these sources meaning within transport or within power plants yeah. is it that you've got certain like you talked about the 210 megawatt yeah. magic number yeah. for segregation of the policy yeah is there some sort of let's just focus on these 20 percent of our quote-unquote problematic sources is, is how much of that applies to 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 whether it's transport or power plants, can, can you sort of share any thoughts on, on, on that? So on a city by city basis, then you can go after the low hanging fruit. One is your waste burning. So here, that's the, the, the blue sector. Uh, it looks small these days, but uh, depending on season, sure. it could be as high as like 10, 15%. But, so, these, but also like in power plants, a number of people here in the room are also power plant interested. Yeah. So is it that certain power plants are disproportional from a national perspective? Or, or it's very local. Obviously that disproportional translates into some cities yeah. being worse off. You talk of Korba with 10 gigawatts. Yeah. Hopefully those are all new cleaner plants. <laughs> those are actually old, <laughs> the, the, some of them are old as well. So if you look from a, from a nationally as a power sector perspective, you have a, a disproportionate pollution coming from older power plants using old technology, old boiler sizes, and still using that loophole because they were uh, set up under that regime. And then you have the newer power plants, which are a lot more swanky and, and, and higher performance ratio, disproportionate. So, in the yeah, so we do see a strong, and when they, were, when they were commissioned. 
So is that a sufficient demarcation point? Sure. Meaning, it is possible. You showed a breakdown of the states by the, some states have disproportional of the old dirty plants also. Yes. So now, what are policy mechanisms to sort of encourage them? How would states react if we say no? Sorry, thou must shut down, or or what what or do R N M? What you were? They will immediately say yes. We can shut down. Pesa de do. Pesa de do. We we have been doing this. Pesa de do. No, <laughs> the states, we were just uh, sensitizing to the states to uh, remove all older plants, uh, and they said, okay, no problem. You just provide us the funds. So the central government gives us the funds, or the state government gives us the funds. Issue is not they don't want to replace it. Issue is the funding. And I mean, so would it also cause capacity problems for them? Because even though it's a small percentage, for some states it's a higher some percentage. Some states, it is, uh, it is, they can't replace our plants. It's not only uh, funding, but even suppose if you take Tamil Nadu, I know one power plant, it has lived its life. Means, yeah. But they're not, able to, uh, they're not able to close it because uh, there is a deficit already. So until a new plant comes which can replace that, till that they are just trying to extend that plant. Same thing with the Punjab as well. There are three power plants that uh, support the load. And all of them are old. Uh, Rubnagar, Govindgarh, there's one more. And uh, Batinda. All three of them, they're old. They're they from the 80s and 90s and they're still running because they don't have any power plants. And the extra load is actually going from uh, Haryana, the Jajar and Hisar power plants, and they, they are the ones supporting the load, but uh, no new power plants coming up, but the population has almost doubled in the last 30 years. So, so I have two questions. Um, if you could go back to the Ababai, do the source contributions change by the R? Yes, okay. that changes as well. Yeah. So basically at noon on a given day, a vehicular contribution is X, not in terms of load, but in terms of concentrations that yeah. you're able to. That's also Because right. you're doing a bottom up. Yeah. Uh, the second question was, uh, you talked about uh, vehicular emissions yeah. uh, and how we're using the Google Maps travel times to, uh, this might be a very specific question, I'm sure. to this offline. Um, but, so it, it sounds like, I mean, the, the travel speeds are going to be, um, low when you have higher volumes yeah. uh, and therefore vehicular exhaust uh, pollution due to vehicular exhaust is presumably going to be lower because the volume Not is the lower. exhaust, the, the resuspension will be The resuspension is going to be lower um, <coughs> but the vehicular, ex uh, the vehicular <coughs> exhaust will be higher because the yes. volumes are higher. Yes. Uh, so there's this... And they'll be less efficient if they're standstill. And they're yes. less efficient. So given that um, you have these two Essentially, going in yeah. the opposite direction. How do you model something like that? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we can do the same thing. Okay. Uh, yeah. okay. Uh, it may be a very technical question. Yeah. So we may. Uh, I will actually show you how that's done. Yeah. <laughs> Not even to explain. One, one yeah, very interesting information I want to share. And now, government of India has allowed swapping of coal within the state. Yeah. So yeah. So states have now, if having some uh, efficient power plant, yes. so they can shift the coal of an inefficient power plant to the efficient power plant. Yeah. So if they have got the margin with them to close on some of the uh, megawatt to be generated, yeah. they can be efficient. That's true. So I think that, that will solve the partial problem. That's assuming that the availability or swapping was the bottleneck to yes. the dispatch norms. Right. But it's not clear that that's the only driver or credit. But it, it can be a major driver. Well, but the problem is, if it is a 210 megawatt, right, and they want to put up 660, the same land cannot be used for 660, number one. Number two, dismantling of the existing power plant is also not that easy. It takes three years. Right, so swapping is good. Uh, there is a policy of the Ministry of Power that if you have a subcritical unit, 110, 210, whatever, and you want to put new supercritical units, the same coal can be shifted. But there is a technical issue about the location of the plant and the area available. So everyone tried, many, many companies tried, like you talk about Haryana, UP, like Panki, 
Yeah. Panki thermal power plant is one of the oldest, 110 megawatt into 3 unit. But in that area, you cannot put one single 660 power plant. So that is the issue actually. So it's more a paper ability than a practical is, is your assessment. Because policies are many. If you see, I mean with our new power minister, he is very, you know, uh, ambitious and you know, there are a lot of policies, but the, the practical approach is missing somewhere, you know, the technical part of it. So he talks about, you know, putting uh, all super criticals, but then you have renewable now. With renewable, you have to have the issue of grid instability. And the whole world, like we give example of Australia, you also talked about. They started all these 30 years back. And today they are, whatever, in, they are enjoying the least pollution and all. And we have just started. So I think uh, we need to take some more time, have a clear roadmap, how plants should be decommissioned and you know new plants to be added. And there should be a clear you know balance between renewable and base load plants. A lot of uh, water scenarios. Okay. <laughs> Do you have any data on water consumption in water? We have that is not a subject. And uh, also CSE, 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 has CSE has done, has done some here. studies on that. Yeah, that report actually talks about water consumption as well. And then uh, Prayas, Prayas Energy Group in Pune, so they have done a very detailed analysis on water resources. But even so, so the panels we, need water. Mm -hmm. We primarily focus on cleaning. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's a non-zero. I mean, it's not enormous, but it is a constraint in certain geographies. Sharad, all these activities, you talked about uh, Center for Environment, I mean Science and Environment, Preya, Shakti and all those. How they are funded to do all these activities? Is there any <laughs> business behind all these or so are we should ask charity? our friends uh, for it's supporting? Yes. No, because yes. everyone I mean, is working and they are all working in a different direction. Yeah. And uh, we attend all of them and they are not converging anywhere. So who is funding this and what is the business plan for your company? What exactly you want to achieve? By uh, doing all this, I personally, I don't have. Apart any from serving the nation, I don't have any business <laughs> plan. We do purely out of research interest, and uh, we do raise funds from foundations for uh, okay. for supporting our ideas. Okay. But these are not consulting works. These are not consulting works in any which way. So these are public research products. We want uh, state boards to take ownership of something like this. Right. Because it's state board's responsibility to alert public what is the pollution and what kind of harm it does tomorrow or day after tomorrow, or what kind of harm has it done in the past as well. So, so for us, it's a pure research interest and a, and a, a public interest uh, product that we put together. And as part of as part of this, we work with many institutions, IITs, IIT Bombay, Delhi. Uh, Shukla Pant University and like for many different institutions we get students to support this work. And so we're not just putting out a number, so we want to be able to defend that number as well. Mm -hmm. And hence the, the surveys and, and the sampling work that we that, that goes on behind it. So when he asked a very technical question on, on how do we hour by hour, grid by grid mm -hmm. have an assessment of uh, vehicular emissions, a, a lot of thought goes behind it. So here you will see a small number, of, this is the contribution of passenger transport, but mm -hmm. there is a good logic that goes behind it. And so we want the state boards to, to take ownership of logic like that. So, so, so why foundation would fund me, that's a thing question to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. uh, if, if I could just ask, I mean, coming back to power plants, because that's an, of interest to mm -hmm. many, many folks. Yeah. The black lines are the power plants in this uh, graph. Yeah. If I look at two different Power days, and yeah. Yeah. Um, if I look at two different days at similar time periods, yeah. in some cases you've got a very small contribution in the middle during the dip, yeah. while in another day at the similar time frame or what appears to be similar, it's a much, much larger. Okay. Shouldn't it directly just be a function of, I mean, so first thing is you don't know for sure what is the dispatch going to be. So you're assuming certain fraction core yeah. for, for your projection. Assuming coal is similar, shouldn't the black bars look very similar every day or uh, is it wind speed? Wind speed, it's entirely because of the so wind it's speed. Yeah. At, at 
atmospheric this concentration which is like right different. this is the local concentration so the it, emissions would be in the same range yeah but the concentrations will be purely dependent on temperature and the wind speeds from the fact i mean a lot of other factors so how much variance does that create so if i'm now coming back to your suggestion we use these data for load dispatchers yeah how much stochasticity is there in this in the sense wind man, uh, power plants fret that they cannot do you know even 3 hours ahead they've got some reasonable wide band of uncertainty for wind speed so if you're now saying 3 days ahead how much delta or uncertainty would you say you would also typically have or does it average out so we have a lot more accuracy for the next 24 hours Okay. And that's primarily driven from uh, the, the meteorological forecast themselves. And then the second day, third day, the accuracy kind of goes down. But so how much is that back? Like in wind, go government has talked about a 30% prediction range for output that they have to do day ahead scheduling, for yeah. example. Is that a similar sort of number from your uncertainty levels? Or? Since we are doing a, even in a forecasting... Um, so day ahead, let's say 24 yeah, hours. Yeah, day ahead. This is still considered a long term. So we have some supercomputing systems where we can do forecasts every three hours. So if we have a system like that in place, that will really serve, a, a, a directly serve the discoms, saying, OK, the power plant emissions from, um, so here, most of the winds are northwesterly, which means a lot of pollution from the charger area that will be coming into our domain. But if the winds move more to, say, easterly tomorrow, then we'll start seeing a signature from, in, in this time frame, then we start seeing signature from the Badalpur, Faridabad, the Badalpur is closed, and also from Dadri. So you see a small uh, spot that shows up here at some times. So, so, so you can predict, we, we, the Power plant. Technically, it can be done. Technically, it can be done in a three-hour advance notice to tell, okay, Dandri is going to affect Delhi a lot more in the next three hours. Yeah. So they can they can actually slow down and make not that happen. So you've now raised two points. I mean, one is the economics. You said there needs to be a value place to the pollution. If I'm an operator, if I just or brick kiln, I mean, if anyone just spews it out, that's one problem. So the second you're now raising, which is even more interesting, do we have transfer mechanisms? So now you're suggesting Delhi could be paying its neighboring states yeah. or having some mechanism to compensate for their backing down. Yeah. I mean, do you think that that's one way to go ahead? Do, do other well, countries do anything like that? Uh, I mean, it, this it, is a new market beyond a carbon it market. Be it's a pollution the, market. It can be yeah. done by the RADC, that is a regional... Uh, no, so one mechanism one is a centralized control yeah. base. The other would be a more disaggregated So this was done in, uh, in the greater Beijing area, Beijing, Taiwan, and Tianjin, the three different uh, the big satellite cities. It covers an area over 200 by 200 kilometers. So they have done that. So it's very similar to your um, carbon trading, and you call it emissions trading, basically. So you, you basically say that, OK, this season, or these particular hours, if we shift from from day one to day engine, so what kind of uh, benefits do we get in terms of health? So this is something it happened more from a, more from a study perspective, and we've seen it. Very interesting. But is it viable but in the sense carbon? People talk of you know twenty dollars a ton, fifty dollars, certain price ranges. What are the numbers we're talking about? Do we have to value a life at? One crore to make it viable, or what's the statistical value of life you would kill me for that. But anyway, so uh, for this, we actually looked at uh, the insurance policies. So how, how much people buy the insurance, like life insurances. We use that as a proxy. So we have an average of about twenty lakhs in India. SVL. SVL. As the SVL. Yeah. Okay. No, but so based on that, is that enough to cause actual signaling to ask, for example, if Delhi to tell the neighbors back down? Is if that you, yeah, if you put money value, I think that's more than enough it's to more justify. Than enough. Yeah. Okay. So, but there's this one thing if we move, swap electric power generation between power plants, that's possible, theoretically, yes. 
can it be done on a three hour, six hour notice? That is also yes. A big if in that is, a big if needed is, they have to be open with the generation capacities, generation loads on an hour by hour basis, a minute by minute basis in the public domain so that that kind of decision can happen. But this decision can and happen. They, and they have to believe in the modeling as well. <laughs> yes. not, not three hours in advance. It is done 24 hours in advance, right? It can be done. No, met so C can be done is, yeah, but also the norms of state operations have eight periods of revamp. So there are three hour blocks that they use. No, in no, the no, it's 15 minute block of 96 blocks. That's ABT. Yeah. You have to give the projection that how much megawatt you are going to feed into the grid. Yeah. That is done 24 hours in advance. Okay. So three hours in advance and you know the again bringing coal-fired power plant, uh, ramping up, ramping down. Is again well, one is the technical ramp up, ramp down. But you've raised an interesting point, which is there are penalties to deviation from a schedule. It is. It is. So it just is. like Paris makes it free to use the public metro on those days, yeah. we could socialize or waive deviations that are based on a certain environmental criteria, yeah. Yeah. potentially. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting yeah. Exercise to, to to simulate, and you have to keep in mind this is a very intangible product. I mean, you are asking the power plant to not produce or swap based on uh, a intangible product, saying we're going to reduce air pollution because winds are going to be moving from your plant to the city, so okay. reduce it. And, and, and we need the plant operators to buy that concept and and. So it's a long battle, but theoretically it's definitely possible, and it's a it's a great gesture. That really works. Um, yeah. Thank you, Sharad. Uh, for I request everyone to join us for some refreshments and stay and uh, continue the conversation. Thank you.